to introduce myself more formally. I'm Jennifer Hinkle. I am the program manager for the Culture of Respect Collective, which is what we're here to talk about today. I do come from, with a background in social work and higher education case management. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Tambros Corman. I'm the Senior Director of Culture of Respect here at NASPA, and I have been with Culture of Respect um, essentially since its inception uh, back in, gosh, about 2013. Uh, so it's been, it's been quite a while at this point, um, and I am I'm thrilled to be here and speaking with you all today. So I'm going to take you through our agenda uh, for the next hour or so. We're going to talk a little bit about the current landscape. There's obviously lots going on right now in higher education and in the larger national and just global um, perspective. And so we want to take a moment to kind of soak that all in and recognize the ways in which it intersects with the work that we do around sexual violence. We're then going to talk to you a little bit about culture of respect and the collective, and uh, we'll follow up with any questions and next steps that you all may have. As Jennifer noted, um, we have left time at the end for questions and answers, but if you have questions, feel free to use that chat, excuse me, that questions box that Jennifer mentioned, and um, we can try to address those uh, as we go if they um, if they are pertinent and we have the, you know, an opportunity to pull those in, so feel free. So I think the, the items that you see bulleted on this slide are gonna come as no surprise really to any of you. Um, there is so much happening, as I said, in higher education as well as on a larger, larger global scale that is impacting our work in student affairs every single day. Um, again, probably not a surprise to many of you that the new Title IX uh, rule dropped from the Department of Education just last month, and colleges and universities are still working very um, quickly and diligently to understand the implications of those new rules and how um, we can actually go about implementing um, you know, the, the guidance that was provided in that rule, as it does change a lot of the standard operating procedures and policies that colleges and universities may have have been currently using. We're obviously also in this incredible moment for the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement and, um, and in this long-standing fight for equity, inclusion, and racial justice, which has really um, reached this incredible tipping point. Um, it is obviously a challenging topic and one that all of us um, continue to try to um, enhance our skills and our learning on every single day and find opportunities to bring um, these equity and inclusion um, opportunities into the work that we do, not just in our personal lives, but in our professional lives as well. And last but not least, again, we are in this moment of COVID-19 and trying to figure out what a new normal is going to look like uh, when we all go back to um, our physical campuses or our uh, virtual campuses or whatever that may mean. So there are a lot of um, pieces to consider right now as we are doing this work. We also have a, a huge amount of challenges that come along with each of those intersecting events. The capacity issue, as I'm sure all of you are well, well aware, is real. Um, capacity, emotional capacity, um, number of days in the, uh, in the excuse me, number of hours in the day to get work done um, while folks, folks may be furloughed or um, working under challenging circumstances, all of that is very, very real. As well as the um, kind of capacity of our colleagues of color who may be dealing with, who are dealing with um, so many other issues that are um, very real and very pressing. And as, as we all are being allies and, apprentice and um, accomplices in that work as well. So I think it's reasonable to say that everyone's capacity is very, very stretched right now. We're also at a time of extremely limited resources. Um, we know that uh, institutions are looking very closely at their budgets in light of all of the challenges that are happening right now, the um, economic challenges that are associated with COVID-19, and thinking about how to do more with less resources, um, as I think everyone is trying to do in all sides of their life. And last but finally not, not least, we're looking at this upcoming implementation deadline for that new Title IX rule. That is August 14th. And despite um, uh, lawsuits that are currently in progress, 
um, against the Department of Education to try to get a stay on the Title IX rule. It is our understanding that institutions should be planning on moving forward toward that implementation deadline of August 14th. So I know institutions are scrambling to try to make all of those various challenges um, work on their campuses. And I just want to talk for just a brief second. I don't want to belabor these points, but I want to recognize the ways in which um, there's this really um, sexual violence kind of sits at an intersection of all of these different issues. So obviously with Title IX, we've made so much progress in the last couple of years in terms of um, advocating for our survivors and for making sure that we have policies that are, um, that are clearly written and work for everyone on campus as best they can, as well as adjudication and investigation procedures. And we just don't wanna see any backsliding on that when we've come so far over the last couple of years. Um, when it comes to racism and racial injustice, and there's so much to consider there. Obviously, we have the ways in which sexual violence has been historically used to dominate and control um, communities of color. And that is um, something that we are still trying to um, work our way through and unpack the damage and undo the damage that has been done by that. We, you know, we recognize that communities of color are disproportionately affected by sexual violence and under-resourced and underserved when it comes to dealing with the repercussions of that violence. And lastly, um, you know, we want to be mindful of the fact that even, you know, months ago, it was an entirely appropriate, you know, it was an important conversation to be having on campus about the ways in which communities of color may not have felt comfortable for very good reasons, reaching out to um, police and campus security authorities when there were instances of sexual violence. And obviously, that challenge has just become ever more real and ever more present um, in the last couple of weeks as we have um, worked through or continue to work through um, the the ripple effects of uh, the the death of George uh, George Floyd and the back and the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, COVID nineteen is obviously still incredibly real at this intersection as well. We know that. Um, student affairs professionals are dealing with sexual violence in kind of a new way. Um, things may have moved off the campus, um, you know, the, the traditional ways in which we think about addressing sexual violence may look very different now that folks are quarantined or social distancing at home. We're not able to uh, reach our students in person in ways that we may have previously um, been accustomed to doing. And we know things that like investigations and adjudications have moved to a remote or virtual space, which is a shift for so many of us. Um, so all of those things are very, very real. I also want to just take a moment to acknowledge um, as, a, as a person, as an individual, that this work is, um, is messy and I am trying really, really hard in my best way. Um, I think um, one of the ways people talk about it is, is leading with their heart in terms of trying to get in particularly um, the language around racism and racial injustice correct. And um, I acknowledge that that is very much a work in progress for me and for my colleagues. We recognize um, the privilege that we come from when it comes to um, being white women um, and, and the roles that, and the privilege that give us. And I just um, appreciate you all um, understanding that Sometimes we're going to get it wrong, but we are always going to do everything in our power to be advocates and allies and accomplices in this work. So I just want to say that up front in the spirit of full transparency. And thank you for your um, space and grace and patience as we try to do our best and, and be those accomplices. So a little bit about culture of uh, respect, which is what so many of you uh, hopefully are here to hear about today. Um, culture of respect, our mission is really to build the capacity of educational institutions to end sexual violence through ongoing expansive organizational change. And I know that's a lot of words and a lot of buzzwords, um, and we're gonna unpack those a little bit more as we uh, talk over the next couple of, uh, the next hour or so. So these are three of the guiding principles that kind of underlie all the work that Culture of Respect does. Um, firstly, we come from a public health approach to, ad to addressing the problem of sexual violence. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. We also rely on evidence-based practices and emerging um, and best practices wherever possible. We know that, again, as a public health approach, we need to be relying on the evidence for what works or what we think has promised to work. And so we will con you know, consistently bring um, all the work that we do back to those practices. And last but not least, we have a real philosophy of bringing everyone to the table to do this work. Campus sexual violence is not something that can ever be 
fixed, so to speak, by just one person, nor should it be. This is really the work of everyone at an institution to address the campus culture and to be part of the solution around sexual violence. And so again, we are going to carry that thread through our conversation um, and the ways in which our work hopefully um, gets all of those various stakeholders to the table to be part of the solution. So I just want to touch a little bit on some research that um, really just came to light in the last couple of weeks that we are so excited about. Um, the University of Kansas, which is actually a member of the Culture of Respect Collective, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, just put out this research about um, the ways in which colleges and universities are able to um, to approach making organizational change around sexual violence. And they identified some key barriers and some key um, factors for success. So some of the barriers that they pulled out from their research um, included limited capacity, um, something we talked about a little bit earlier, lack of knowledge around how to do this work, limited student engagement, and the, str and the struggle of bureaucracy and bureaucratic structures, which I'm sure we can all appreciate and identify with um, in so many ways in, in our work. Um, and they talked about what was really effective in being able to make change or um, be effective in this work on campus, which was a positive campus culture and having the support of pre-existing programming in place and really being able to ensure that that program programming was able to meet the needs of the constituents on campus. So I want you to just remember those kind of barriers and facilitators um, as we talk through our work today, because I think um, we were so wonderfully um, not surprised because I think we knew that this was the case, but so pleased to see our structure for the work that we do align with what they found in their research. So we just wanted to share that with you. Um, the citation is down below and we encourage you to take a look at that research. So I'm gonna um, briefly introduce two of our signature tools and then I'm gonna turn things over to Jennifer in just a minute. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the, um, the image on your left, kind of a helix looking, I don't know, wheel and spoke image, if you will, um, is called the Culture of Respect Core Blueprint. And this is really the framework that underlies all the work that we do. These six pillars that you see outlined here on the slide um, are really the six key areas that we engage all institutions on when it comes to making change around sexual violence. Obviously, having clear policies is important. Having great prevention education materials is important. But if an institution really wants to make comprehensive change around sexual violence, we feel it is imperative to be working on kind of all six cylinders, if you will. And so we um, bring institutions back to these six areas over and over again to ensure that they're taking a holistic approach to this work. The companion to the core blueprint is the core evaluation. And this is a rigorous self-assessment organized around these six pillars that really helps an institution inventory their policies, their programs, and their procedures um, based around these six areas. It helps an institution assess the extent to which they are implementing best or promising practices in these six areas. I share these with you because these two elements are gonna come up um, again and again throughout our discussion today. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the collective. As I said, that is the area for which within culture of respect that I am primarily responsible. So this program is an ambitious two-year program that brings together institutions of higher education who are dedicated to ending campus sexual violence and guides them through a rigorous process of self-assessment and targeted organizational change. Again, a lot of words, um, a lot of words we use over and over again, but as we said earlier, each diverse cohort relies on that same expert developed public health framework and cross campus collaboration, peer led learning, professional development to make meaningful programmatic and policy changes. Participating institutions receive strategic support and technical assistance throughout the process, as well as detailed documentation of campus initiated changes that support survivors, prevent sexual violence, and communicate that violence is unacceptable. So as I said, the program is a two-year program. So to look a little bit at the components in the timeline, the first piece or stage of the program is the of the collective is you, the institution and an expression of dedication to addressing sexual violence. So now that I'm looking at it, maybe we should turn it around because I feel like this should really be the foundation of what we're doing. Um, but that next piece to add to it and that key component is undergoing a comprehensive self-assessment, so our core evaluation. 
institutions that take part in the collective complete a baseline and a final evaluation so that we can compare across those two years the, and review the outcomes and the impact that the program has had on institutional policies, procedures, and climate. So it's very important that this core evaluation, this self-assessment, is done honestly and in a way um, that we're able to recognize that nobody is perfect and that's okay. The last key component of the collective is making that targeted organizational change. So in order to achieve this, we work with collective institutions to help them develop a customized action plan based in large part on the results from their baseline core evaluation. And then we support them in the implementation of that plan over the remainder of their time in the collective. So it certainly isn't the end of an institution's responsibility or dedication to making change. It is designed to help jumpstart that process and to really begin thinking about how to effectively make change at this institutional and organizational level. So to look at it a little bit differently in terms of a timeline, uh, on the screen now is an overview of the timeline for the upcoming fifth cohort of the collective. It's weird to say fifth cohort when we're only in fourth right now, um, but January through March is really that program launch and getting started and understanding, getting your feet wet, um, but getting that, getting ready for the core evaluation, getting your team together. Then over the spring of that first year, you're gonna administer the core evaluation. And then over the next few months of that year, you're going to develop your, what we call your individualized implementation plan or IIP submit it for feedback, and then make any revisions in order to move forward. Then that second year is all about implementation and continuing in your professional development. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the benefits, the tangible benefits of the collective membership um, in a few moments, but this is when you're really taking part in those webinars and learning more about the things that you could change on top of making those active changes on your campus. And then again, at the very end, you're going to re-administer the core evaluation. And I will go back and say just a little bit that this is also, we are flexible in a sense that we know institutions, particularly this year with COVID, everything happening, we're not sticking to this exact timeline with our institutions. We're adjusting things and being flexible because we recognize that everyone is human and there's a lot going on. And so Ali and I in supporting all of you are very cognizant of all of this. And if you aren't done by November 22nd or 2022 with your final evaluation, that's fine. We're going to work with you. So to overview the multiple tangible benefits of enrolling in the collective, like I was talking about, um, it begins with the facilitation of the baseline and the final core evaluation. There's the facilitation and the creation uh, or facilitation of the creation and implementation of an individualized action plan. You receive two registrations to the 2022 NASPA Strategies Conferences. So like I said, in that second year of enrollment, two registrations for the online certified peer educator train the trainer course, which means two staff on your campus will be trained to facilitate peer educator training to students on your campus. Access to the Culture Respect Core Constructs Toolkit, um, campus-wide access to the Culture Respect Foundations course, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide, a virtual or in-person site visit to provide institutions with additional support and individualized technical assistance to fit their needs, and then behind all of that and incorporated under all of that is that two years of ongoing direct support, expert technical assistance, professional development, peer-led learning opportunities, and other opportunities for collaboration across institutions, because we recognize that that is the key, and that is what where institutions often um, get the best ideas in, in that collaboration. So Foundations is one of our newer tools. It's an online course that prepares current and future student affairs professionals with the tools they need to be influential allies in campus sexual violence prevention and response. So it's a six module course. It's taught by NASPA staff with expertise in social work, student affairs, public health, peer education, assessment, and violence prevention. And it's a great follow-up to any introductory Title IX or Clery Act training provided by your institution. The idea, like I said, is really about developing allies and so that you can not only have that multi-stakeholder campus team, that CLT at your core, but you have other individuals who you're able to delegate 
programming to or who were there to help in the mission toward creating a culture of respect, as kitschy as it sounds. So ultimately, what institutions put into the collective has much to do with what they get out of it. By making a public commitment to ending campus sexual violence, undergoing rigorous and honest self-assessment, engaging in peer-led peer -led learning, I can't speak today, and professional development opportunities, relying on evidence-based research, institutions are able to work toward creating a culture of respect. So in a few slides, we'll speak more about the data and outcomes that we've seen from assessments of collective institutions. But first, let's talk a little bit about that current landscape that Ali mentioned earlier. So how do we help institutions make or meet their needs in this current landscape? So with the, two, with the new Title IX regulations being shared and campuses being required to implement them very, very soon, in less than two months, we recognize that there's a huge amount of work for many institutions to prepare. So our perspective ultimately is that the rule is the floor and culture of respect and what we want to do in sexual violence prevention education response is to reach for the ceiling. That's how we're actually going to meet our mission. And so we've got a forthcoming Title IX guide. That's something that our current collective institutions are going to have available and I'll show an example of in a moment um, to really help institutions go beyond compliance and to reach for um, reach for that evidence-based and best practice. Um, there's also that constant access to NASPA staff and resources, including our folks over on our research and policy team, survivor advocates who currently work on staff, and experts in respondent services. And we also have a network of colleagues around the country. So if somebody doesn't work at NASPA, we certainly have connections to folks that we can put you in contact with who, if we don't have the answers, we will help you find the answers. So an example of our coming soon Title IX guide is here on the screen. So we have, it's gonna look a little different, but the idea is a checklist with a prompting question leading you to where the question is in the final rule, allowing you to figure out whether or not you've met that compliance, but then, okay, how do we go further? So are training materials for Title IX personnel publicly available on the institution's website? Great, yes, you are compliant. But does your institution maintain a comprehensive website where all information related to Title IX processes and procedures can be easily accessed? And we've got examples of a really great comprehensive institutional website. And I'll go ahead and tell you one of those is UT Knoxville. It's fantastic. Um, does your institution publish an annual Title IX report separate from your annual Clery um, security report to maximize transparency within the campus community? And how often does your institution proactively communicate with campus stakeholders about their in, about your institutional strategy to address sexual violence? So again, this is just kind of an example of how you work with institutions to go beyond and to really support in the midst of what I feel like I can only describe as chaos. So again, focusing on the current landscape and the growing recognition of inequity and racism uh, against black people and black trans people, um, who I want to speak to directly as well, we want to first recognize the optics of our team. So as Ali said before, as two cis white women, we recognize what privilege comes with that. But we also have a commitment, like we said, to being accomplices in this work. We've got a wonderful network of folks who we work to raise their voices and to help us educate the community in these topics so that then we can further educate our campus community on these topics. So for instance, one of our one of my favorite colleagues, Malik Washington over at Penn State, has been generous enough, generous enough to provide a webinar, particularly for folks in the collective, to talk more about that intersection of race and sexual violence. And so again, we're able to raise those voices and provide that information to our collective, which is something we know from our evaluations, our core evaluations, is, uh, is not necessarily lacking, but is something that they're really craving and looking for. So utilizing that intersectional lens, recognizing the relationship between sexual violence and identity, Again, going back to the Title IX document that we'll reference again in a moment, it's something that we've interwoven into that and into our core evaluations 
validation questions, um, something we share with folks to help provide feedback and make sure that our lens is not the only lens going into this work. So the other example uh, of our coming student Title IX guide is looking at the question of, are training materials free of sex stereotypes? Okay, yes, you're compliant. But going beyond that, are policies and procedures designed to recognize and address the intersections of sexual violence and marginalized identities? Is there a statement included that anyone, regardless of gender, sex, race, ability, or other identities can experience or perpetrate sexual violence? Are your institutions prevention programs tailored to address the unique needs, challenges, and opportunities of those they're reaching? Additionally, does your institution collect and analyze data about the prevalence of violence by student identity or demographic to better understand that violence may impact specific groups of people on your campus? And last in our list of current landscape, looking at meeting your needs when it comes to COVID. So we work to maximize your limited resources using the core blueprint framework and the collective program model, working together to make this change. We help you build relationships across departments and silos through the campus leadership team, as well as across the collective and across institutions outside of the collective. The core constructs, replicable tools and templates help prevent reinventing the wheel. Uh, it's a really great toolkit that has tangible resources for how to meet each of these six pillars. And again, not have to start from scratch and how do you integrate that into what you're already doing. And then you've got additional hands to help with the work. So when you're educating folks using the foundations course, you're going to have allies when you're educating certified peer educators and having students as leaders on your campus understanding the importance of this work they're going to be able to help you in doing bystander intervention education and truly making a difference on your campus great and i'm going to jump in to tell you a little bit about um kind of what folks got out of the program jennifer spoke a lot about what went into the program and this is what came out for those folks who have already um, gone through the program as jennifer mentioned this is a two-year program so cohorts one and two have already completed um, their full programmatic cycle and so everything you're going to see is really based on the endpoint data um, from those two cohorts the satisfaction data from those two cohorts so um, just keep that keep that in mind so what folks who participated in the program did see was um, greater clarity and visibility for their institutional commitment to addressing sexual violence. They absolutely saw an increased awareness of how that institutional approach was um, essential in addressing sexual violence. We saw collaboration across departments go up and that was really a result of that campus leadership team structure that we are so committed to facilitating. We talked in the very beginning of this presentation about this idea of bringing everyone to the table and I mentioned that it would be reinforced throughout the discussion and so you see that in things like the campus leadership team um, the foundations course which again helps you build kind of a bench of allies to help you do this work there's greater accountability for actually making this work happen we know how challenging it is when there are competing demands all the time for your time and energy um, things like making large-scale change at your institution somehow always um, falls to the back of the line when there are um, fires to be put out um, on a daily basis so that accountability with the culture of respect collective program really helps to ensure that institutions are moving this work forward even if it is a kind of a slow and steady pace it is that forward progress that we're looking for and we saw the that people People felt a greater sense of connection to this work and felt more um, prepared when it came to um, their knowledge and skills and their understanding of the best practices that really underpin this work. So the actual impact, um, we've talked uh, enough about kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the program that hopefully all of this makes sense. But as Jennifer mentioned, folks um, took the core evaluation at baseline and again at the pro end of the program. And what we saw that was that their scores increased in five out of six pillars on average um, from baseline compared to endpoint. So that really means that organically institutions as a result of being part of this program were um, adapting practices, making changes to policies, um, 
trying new programs that resulted in their scores organically going up. And the aggregate score went up about 50 points. We also have a federal um, guidance and requirements checklist that we provide kind of at baseline and at an endpoint. And we saw that on average institutions were um, in compliance with about three additional federal requirements at the end of the program. And um, I think probably most exciting for me is the objectives that they set out for themselves, the things that they as an institution that decided were important to them when it came to raising the bar on this work. Um, they identified on average 22 objectives for their institution to accomplish over the course of the program and made progress or completed 85% of those by the end of their two years. Um, and I think what's also really exciting about the program is um, the ways in which being part of the collective the collective opened their eyes to how much more work could be done we spoke to so many people who at the end of the program um felt like but now i've kind of seen behind the curtain and i can't unsee it i realize how much more work there is to be done and i can't wait to get started so um you know just a, just a heads up that once you once you see behind that curtain how much you can do around campus sexual addressing campus sexual violence um it's an exciting um it's an exciting opportunity to embrace um, and we saw that the components of the collective were really impactful on the institution's effort to address sexual violence. So participants felt like the core evaluation was really effective in helping them identify areas for growth, um, that their plan, their IIP, helped them really define their institutional goals around sexual violence, and it helped them reach their goals, and that their relationship with the culture of respect held them accountable, as I said, for kind of that, that progress, that slow but steady progress to making large-scale institutional change. And we found that they were really greatly satisfied with the parts of the program um, that, that they engaged with, um, that they felt like there was great value in getting that core evaluation baseline report and the qualitative and qualitative and quantitative feedback provided by Culture of Respect. Um, along the way, lots of ad hoc technical assistance, which is um, really just a great way of saying that um, when folks needed help, when they had a question, um, they knew they could pick up the phone and call us or drop us an email, which I think when you're doing this work and it feels so overwhelming, um, maybe one of the, the best parts of all of this is that there is someone who can serve as a resource to you um, and to, to help do some of that legwork that you know no one else really has time to do in their day. Um, the toolkit and those replicable tools that Jennifer talked about, the professional development events that are available on a monthly basis, and what makes me um, really, really happy is that really high bar of collect, connecting with the colleagues um, in the program during in-person NASPA events. So we really facilitate opportunities at the NASPA strategies conferences, which hopefully folks are familiar with. There's a, a specific track for sexual violence prevention response at that conference, as well as for AOD, mental health and well-being and health promotion, um, as well as at the annual conference. For, so carving out time for folks who are in this program to um, be in the same room together whether that's physically or virtually, and um, talk to each other about their experience, learn from each other's experiences, um, and benefit from the knowledge of other folks who are doing this work. I'm going to turn it back to Jennifer. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our participants. So thus far, uh, we have had nearly 120 institutions of higher education take part in this program. Um, on the screen is a map of all of our collective institutions to date, and we're incredibly proud of the diversity of our program participants and have worked with public and private four-year institutions, community colleges, historically black university colleges and universities, religiously affiliated institutions, those in larger system-wide networks, um, and are currently or have currently worked with one Canadian campus and two institutions in Mexico, which I am really excited about. And our contact in Mexico has recently joined our Culture of Respect Advisory Board so that we can really put a focus on how we um, do this work internationally. To help share a little bit more about what schools are able to get out of participation, we also wanted to share a quote today from Dr. James Campbell, the Assistant Vice President for Student Development and Compliance at Providence College. So Dr. Campbell said, the Culture of Respect Collective at Providence College brought wide engagement across the campus, faculty, staff, and students working hard together to address sexual assault. In addition to the outcomes we are implementing, the process itself built greater trust and collaboration in our campus community. 
working with NASPA, our state health department, and local crisis center infused the experience with both expertise and credibility. The collective has been a highly beneficial experience for our campus community. We also wanted you to hear a little bit from folks somewhat directly. Um, so we've got a very brief video for you to watch with us um, with some other folks in the collective sharing about their experience. The collective really helped us change how we as an institution viewed this type of work when it comes to interpersonal violence prevention. Uh, really made some significant change uh, for the university, for our policies, and for our students. Sometimes this work, even with others on your own campus, can feel lonely or siloed. And I think knowing that you're part of the greater network has been immensely fulfilling and very supportive. The folks at um, the collective are always there. I can call them anytime. They are props and um, very eager to help. Please check it out. It's yeah, I think it's really worth um, the investment and time to participate in the Cultural Respect Collective. Anyone who's interested in joining the collective should keep in mind that any investment you make in the safety of your students is probably worth at least investigating. Normally I get technology. My apologies, everyone. All right. So moving forward. Uh, next steps, we will be following up with an email um, to folks with a few more materials and we'll give you a recording, a link to the recording of the session. So if you want to share it with anyone else or if you had to jump off for any reason and, wanted, and want to rewatch it, jump back in, you are absolutely able to. Um, we would love, to, I would love to have follow-up meetings with folks to talk a little bit about the culture at your institution and how maybe um, working with the collective might be beneficial to you. So if that's something you'd like to proactively do, please feel free to visit my bit.ly, which is bit.ly forward slash j-h-e-n-k-l-e um, and hold a spot in cohort five for your institution. So the application is not due until November 2nd, but Ali, I'll talk about in a moment, a few um, additional benefits that we've got for folks who may wanna use their end of your funds. And then cohort five is going to be launching in January of 2021. So first, does anyone oops, have any questions? So Jennifer, we did get one question about um, the ways in which this program um, works specifically for community colleges. Are community colleges a good fit for the collective? Absolutely. I, again, I feel biased when I say, um, that it, it works especially well for those kinds of systems. But what we do is we work to meet institutions where they are. So we absolutely look at institutions in a holistic sense. And so working, we work with a number of community colleges, working with a few right now um, to help figure out then and identify if it's about your CLT. I know at community colleges, it's especially hard to have a lot of staff. One person is probably five different members on a typical CLT of a larger institution. So working with those community colleges to identify individuals in the community um, and really make a change that impacts the larger community outside of just the community college campus. But absolutely, um, we also continue to look at emerging research that identifies or aligns directly with the needs of community colleges. Uh, community colleges are something that NASPA, I'm, I'm very proud of, is very cognizant of and continues to work toward ensuring um, access to information and resources. Great. So another question we have, excellent question, is how many schools are usually included in, in the collective in, in, in any given cohort? Well, that varies. Right now, we have 20 in this cohort. Um, we've had anywhere from, I'm trying to remember the number in one and two. One was about 45 institutions. Two was um, a very big transition year. There was an uh, 
a presidential election happening that I think very much influenced the fact that we had a smaller cohort, about 16 schools. Um, I think folks are waiting and very interested to see what would happen uh, based on the, the new administration. Yeah, so it varies just based on the year, absolutely. So another great question, um, do you help the institution select their campus leadership team? How does that process work? Yeah, so we do have a list of folks there based on, against the, the, the work that we've done and the research that exists, the folks that are ideal to be on those teams, and we can help you troubleshoot and navigate and, and break down and figure out who would be best. But I was speaking to someone earlier today about how larger institutions, you'll often see a really large team of folks all the way from um, having your communications and marketing folks, and sometimes a president's chief of staff, sometimes the dean of students is on the team or the chair of the team at a smaller institution, and there are fewer folks. Um, but it really is about meeting where you are, and we're happy to help you figure out who those best fit people are. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's um, nice about being in the fifth cohort at this point and having a lot of um, not just experience in running the program, but also kind of tools and our own templates and tools ready to go is being able to do things like provide a sample invitation letter to the campus leadership team folks so that you don't have to craft that from scratch. You know, there's a letter that we can provide for you that says basically what you're in inviting folks to and um, what they would be committing to um, so that you can make sure that, you know, you're covering all of those bases. So. Um, we got a quick uh, follow-up question about campus leadership teams, which, so as long as we're on that um, theme, I want to stick with that. Um, and someone asked, can you give a few examples for who would be on this team? Specifically, do you suggest and support advocates being on the team? Absolutely. Um, so in many senses, the more functional areas you have covered, the better, but also recognizing that that doesn't always give you a cohesive team to be able to operate. So. It is, like, like I said before, we've got a list of recommended folks. Um, if you download our core evaluation, which is free, you'll see that list of recommended folks of being on the team. Um, survivor advocates are absolutely recommended as part of that team, as are Dean of Students, conduct folks, student health services, um, Title IX folks, people from any area who may have an impact or knowledge of certain policies. So people from housing, people and, and residence life. Um, so yes, I, ho I hope that's helpful. Um, and if you'd like to email me directly, uh, jhinkle at naspa.org, I'm happy to send you that list directly if that's any easier. And I just went ahead and put a link to the um, core evaluation in the chat. As Jennifer mentioned, anyone can download the core evaluation for free from the NASPA website. That is completely accessible to anyone at any institution. Um, the the part of being um, part of being the collective is um, not just access to the evaluation, but the customized report that comes with it. But we completely understand that institutions um, may be interested in just checking out the core evaluation and seeing um, seeing what's on it. Um, we had one more quick question about the campus leadership team, um, and I love this question, and the question was, can students be on the team? Yes, absolutely, students can and should be on the team. Um, so one of our pillars is school-wide mobilization, and that absolutely includes student buy-in. Um, we recommend multiple students because I personally know how difficult it can be to fit a student's schedule, um, and having that perspective is invaluable because how many times have we as administrators looked at a policy and gone, oh yeah, it's very clear, and then had a student review it and go, yeah, that's clear as mud. Um, but yes, students absolutely should be a part of that. And that is a, a very integral part of our core evaluation as well. And I think one of the questions um, that we get all the time, so I'll just go ahead and proactively answer it is like, what's the right amount of number? What's the right number of people to have on your campus leadership team, so to speak? And it, the answer is it completely depends on your institution. Um, over the course of the last couple of cohorts, I've seen as small as eight and I've seen as large as 70. Um, I don't necessarily recommend 70. I think that that um, came with great, great inclusivity and some um, very easy to spot coming logistical challenge. I think all of you can anticipate what it's like scheduling a meeting for 70 people, um, but they were really working to be 
as inclusive as they possibly can. And so it was a balancing act for that institution. But the right answer um, really just depends on, on your institution um, and what, you know, what stakeholders are going to be at the table um, to make change. Um, I saw a question up here that um, I kind of want to address. I think, um, I hope I'm interpreting it correctly. Um, someone asks, who do you need to be on board to decide to participate in the collective? And that's a great question. Um, I think there's a short answer and a long answer to that question. Um, the short answer is on the application itself, which is very simple and straightforward. It's a couple of um, questions about your institution. Um, and institutional demographics and um, or characteristics, as well as a letter of support from a senior administrator somewhere along the BPSA um, level or higher. We want to make sure that there is that high, high level support for the collective so that when it comes time to make organizational change, you know, someone um, kind of fairly senior high up in the in the institution that says, yes, I, I support making these changes. I, I recognize that this is a value and we need to be examining um, what we could be doing better and making some changes. Um, that said, um, you also want to make sure that you have buy-in from the staff who are really going to be the boots on the ground when it comes to doing this work. Um, we look for two kind of campus leads from each institution to really um, be the point persons who work with us most often, who are going to be responsible for getting culture of respect, the, de the deliverables, um, making sure the meetings are happening. And so you really want to make sure that there's buy-in from those folks as well um, so that um, you know they understand that they are part of this larger process that is happening and how exciting that can be not you know, being told that, you know, suddenly they have new responsibilities that they didn't necessarily know were coming their way. So um, I think that there's a couple ways to interpret that question and they're all, they're all good ones. So the last question that came in um, a couple different times, no surprise, because it's a really important question, is um, about the cost of the collective. So um, it's a great question, um, and we want to be as upfront and tra as transparent as we can about this, because we know that this is, you know, incredibly important to institutions, especially now in this time of limited resources. So for NASPA institutional members, that means your institution is a member of NASPA, not necessarily you as an individual are a member of NASPA. Um, the cost is $8,895 per institution. That covers the entirety of your participation in the program. That is um, all two years of the program um, and covers all of the things that Jennifer talked about earlier in terms of benefits, um, core constructs, foundations, NASPA strategies, uh, registrations for the year after you join, um, just because jet strategies happens in January and the program kicks off in January. So we give you an extra year to kind of get your ducks in a row and get, get it figured out who you want to um, use those two free registrations for strategies. Um, we also recognize that um, for community colleges, um, you know, this is a, a really important work to be doing, but that the, um, that the price associated can be extra challenging. And so we offer um, a pretty steep community college discount, um, again, for institutional members, 4,400, uh, $4,400. $95. Um, but lastly, we know that there are probably a lot of institutions out there who are looking to take advantage of the end of year funds that they have available that may not be um, around in the next calendar year or the next fiscal year. And so um, for institutions who can apply by the end of this month, by the end of um, June, um, you will secure your spot in the program. It will still not kick off until January 2021. So you have some time to get yourself organized. Don't worry, you won't like be starting the work, you know, starting July 1. Um, but we do, we are able to offer two um, free registrations to the 2021 Strategies Conference, which is going to be a virtual conference this year. So it's a really nice incentive um, for folks who may know that they already plan to be to Strategies or send, um, send staff. So um, just something to, um, to consider, but we are happy to um, talk with folks individually, talk with institutions individually um, about any questions they may have about their institutional membership status or pricing, things like that. Um, we do have one other question that came in, so I do want to make sure that we have time for that. And if any if folks have any other questions, we have just a couple minutes left, so feel free to pop those in. Um, but the question that came in is, how are you engaging men in the collective and cohort um, and men um, as men are not often seen as victims of sexual violence? And that's a great question. Um, Jennifer, I can certainly weigh in, or do you want to go ahead? Go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, I think that, 
again, that's kind of built into the fabric of the program itself. Um, this idea of when we talk about who should be on your campus leadership team, um, we want to make sure that we are thinking as creatively and expansively as possible. So I would kind of flip that question back around and say, well, who on your campus is doing the work of engaging men um, and make sure that they have a role to play at the table. There are certainly questions that are going to be part of the core evaluation that prompt you to think about the ways in which you are specifically um, engaging men, um, whether that is um, you know, through fraternity and sorority life, um, through residence halls, through clubs, through athletics, you know, all the different ways in which um, you might have opportunities to reach men and, and folks who identify as men in a variety of spaces. But I think the first step in answering that question is really um, ensuring that those folks who are doing that work on your campus or who want to be doing that work have a seat at the table so that they can be weighing in when it comes to taking the core evaluation and developing that customized plan. So I think that is all the questions that we have for now, unless I've missed anything. Um, but I want to um, thank you all so much for joining us today. I really encourage you, if you do have um, questions for us individually, uh, the information for contacting us is there on the slide. And um, Jennifer, as she mentioned, will be reaching out with an email to follow up. But um, we just, I just want to share, you know, how passionately Jennifer and I feel about this program. I think, um, I know I can speak for myself, I don't want to speak for Jennifer, but I think every day, um, the idea of waking up and having a hand and being part of making large scale change around an issue that is so incredibly pressing as sexual violence and an issue that touches so many of these other pieces and components like we talked about, um, the idea of being able to kind of embrace a culture of respect in all of its interpretations and facets, um, I think is just exciting and challenging and wonderful for us every single day. And we really look forward to the opportunity to work with institutions and individuals who feel the same way. So we hope that um, we can help you in that way through our, our work in the collective. We really look forward to hearing from you. Jennifer, anything else you wanted to add? I know that that was perfect. And I think just that that piece of, I wanna work myself out of a job. Again, that's because <laughs> she might too i i could be a chef one day again told that same person i was having a conversation with earlier that very thing but um we're passionate about this because we're passionate about the mission so we hope to hear from you interact with you um, we do offer um resources and such for folks who are not a part of the collective so explore our website feel free to reach out and we're happy to chat absolutely thanks so much everybody i hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon or morning Bye-bye. Thanks, Al. Bye.